Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia Eberts, and I will be presenting the workings of an author, a look back at my journey as a writer. This was my final semester at JCCC, and it was an unusual one, academically speaking. Um, for my uh, previous classrooms, I've taken many literary and language intensive courses since I'm an English major. Um, but for my last semester, I enrolled in two classes that were way out of my comfort zone, and for great reason. I took yoga because I needed to engage with my spirituality, which is something I've never done before, and I took environmental science to explore the future, 400 years into the future, of our populations and environment. So today I want to share with you how these two classes have gotten me one step closer to publishing my novels. In my current writing, one of the protagonists is an extraordinary yoga practitioner. You're probably wondering, what is a spiritual yogi doing in a science-oriented novel? Well, my intent is to uh, remind us that while science might take us far, it's sometimes it's the spiritually aware people that have some of the biggest impact on humanity. Now, granted, I've only taken pr uh, yoga practice twice a week for four months, so by all means, I'm no yogi expert, but I am a writer. And a good writer creates good characters by exaggerating certain traits and beliefs, which shouldn't be too difficult to do after having personally experienced yoga. Going into it, I knew yoga would benefit my mental and, and physical health. But here's what I didn't know I would learn. Discipline. You learn a heck of a lot of discipline when you are twist and stretch your body to your limits, breathe rhythmically, and try to remain calm with mental clarity. And that's not to mention the meditation part of it. I also learned I was capable of spiritual purification. There are moments in yoga cl class that I felt true peace and love. There were moments where I found myself loving everything from my body and mind to the sun, rain, and wind that greeted me after class to the dozens of people just walking around um, going about their lives all around me. So there's really nothing else like it. And it was in these moments, moments of clarity, where I understood myself better and about um, what I wanted, what I didn't like, what would make me better and happier. I came face to face with the things that really mattered to me without the influence of others telling me otherwise. So what did I do with these things? I accepted. I accepted myself, I accepted my reality, I accepted my place in the universe. I accepted everything in my life and let go of my incessant controlling nature. I'm not always like that though. There are still moments where I struggle and feel lost or overwhelmed, but I'm learning. Practicing yoga has helped me to realign. Everything I learned from yoga is invaluable to me. Aside from gaining in these areas, I now also have a deeper understanding of what it means to be spiritually connected and aware. I now know how to portray my yogi protagonist in a truer form. As for my environmental science class, I also found it to be eye-opening. My current novel, The Degras, is placed 200 years into the future when two scientists discover how to genetically alter um, humans to have supernatural powers. And my following series will be the sequel, which will go another 200 years into the future, where we see how societies develop with the supernatural powers being a common part of life. As you can probably discern, the supernatural powers are the fictional side of the stories, but the development of these future de societies is where my environmental research comes in. My task as a writer will be to map out the societies of the future 400 years from now, Albeit, with a few superpowers here and there, I'm allowed to have a little fun with fiction after all. Anyway, to begin mapping out the possible futures of humanity, I focused on three areas. Populations, economies, and environment. I won't have time to go in depth on any of these, so I will briefly point out a few things under population and environment. Now, don't get me wrong. Econ economic factors are very important, but they are extremely volatile. The one thing I can say about them is that our supply of natural sources or lack thereof will have a huge impact on future economies. All right, now let's go back to population factors. The growth and decline of a population can be influenced by a million and one things. In my research, I focused on factors such as current trends, the standards of living, the sustainability of such standards, and the limiting factors of a population's growth. Let's take a look at just one of these. Current trends suggest the Earth's population could fall anywhere between 9.6 and 12.3 billion over the next century. That's a wide range. 
So what could cause for a population to land at either end of the spectrum? Aside from wars or natural or astronomical catastrophes, there are several other factors to consider. But a main factor is the development of countries. I'll keep it short and sweet here. As countries develop to modern agriculture, medicine, and sanitation, they go through a demographic um, transition where mortality rates drop and populations gradually level out. And the education among girls within a country also plays a huge role. However, countries go through demographic transitions at different rates, and the spread of education can be slow in some regions. So these are some of the areas of unpredictability among dozens of others. If we don't drastically curve population growth, there will be many challenges ahead with the need for millions of additional jobs, farms, educational institutions, hospitals, law enforcement facilities, and residences. Even still, that's not the most concerning. As regions overpopulate, the competition over water sources and land will increase between nations. Civil unrest, anyone? This is just the tip of the iceberg for factors of future populations, and the same applies to my research on the future of environment. In my research, I looked into the effects of different levels of consumption, shortages of food and water, the negative impacts of our toxins in aquatic ecosystems, and the consequences of climate change. All of these fell under one large umbrella, the Earth's carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the number of living organisms a region can support without being environmentally degraded. Once a population surpasses a region's carrying capacity, we notice a feedback effect where a number of, of a population is eradicated. A feedback effect can sometimes even cause the extinction of an entire species. So as our populations continue to grow, we get closer to reaching the Earth's carrying capacity. But it is difficult to qualify the carrying capacity for human life because humans don't live in one uniform manner all around the world. One single population can have a variety of standards of living. So once again, we'll only focus on a small portion of these factors, food and water. Statistics on current resource use is already alarming. As it stands, about 1 billion people go to bed hungry and over 25,000 die from malnutrition or other hunger-related diseases each day. But it's not like there's not enough food to go around. Europeans consume at half the level of the average American, yet if all humans were to consume as Europeans do, the Earth could only sustainably support about 2 billion people. That's less than 30% of the current po human population. As we quickly approach a population of 8 billion to become more agriculturally sustainable, we'd all have to adopt a diet somewhere between that and Italian and that of the people of India, where we eat enough, not too much, mostly fruits and vegetables. Steak dinners would have to be a rare part of our diet. There's also the issue of how agriculture affects our environment. The toxic runoff from agricultural lands makes its way into and pollutes streams, lakes, and oceans. And we add to the strain of aquatic ecosystems by overfishing keystone species and dumping tremendous amounts of our waste into the oceans. We are now at the point where we are witnessing the collapse of the aquatic food chain. All of this, together with the pollution and destruction of other habitats, gradually depreciates the Earth. So far, we have lost over half of the vertebrate species from air, water, and land worldwide since 1970. And I won't even mention the current and future detrimental effects of climate change. You'd think I use all of these facts to, for a, um, a map out another dystopian world, right? Well, despite all of this, I still have hope for humanity because I choose to. And perhaps that's part of my positive yogi energy seeping into my worldview. Here's how I see it. If we are capable of observing, collecting, and analyzing so much data, then we are capable of shifting our ways for a better future with the help of experts. I've decided to use this knowledge base as a starting point for a more positive outlook on our future. Too often we are told we are headed for a disastrous, bleak world, and I like to use my novels to give hope. I'd like to encourage people to look for what can be done, to think of the possible ways we can save the Earth and ourselves. I'd like to tell, or show, as writers should, scientists, politicians, and leaders that we can. My journey as a writer is just beginning, as I've barely scratched the surface here. So I will continue my research over the next year before I start to write my next series. So here goes to creating a better world. Thank you.